Hello and welcome to Access Asia, I'm Yuka Huayi. Coming up in this edition... Thailand's leading opposition party has been found guilty of violating the constitution in their campaign to reform the country's royal defamation law. The Move Forward party now faces possible dissolution. The cars we drive may contain parts made with forced labour in China. A warning from Human Rights Watch in a new report calling on car makers to do more to make sure such materials don't enter their supply chains. And we take a deep dive into Japan's Otokonoko subculture, where men like to dress up as girls. But it's not about sexual orientation or identity, but a form of gender expression. But first, Thailand's draconian Lesser Majesty Law is once again in the international spotlight. The country's highest court has ruled that the opposition party Move Forward had attempted to overthrow the constitutional monarchy by proposing to amend the law, which bans any criticism of the royal family. Its members could now be barred from politics. Our correspondents were at the Supreme Court to hear the verdict and sent us this report. Victory for fans of Thailand's royal institution. I have no words to express my joy. Judges on the Constitutional Court have declared the frontrunner in Thailand's 2023 election to be in violation of the Constitution for proposing to reform the Les Majeste law, also known as Section 112. This part of the criminal code protects the royal institution from any criticism. As they exit the court, tension arises. <laughs> The monarchy has existed in Thailand for more than 700 years. That's why Thais respect this institution. For supporters of the reformist Move Forward Party, the verdict feels like a renewed attempt to prevent the people from taking control of the country. Although the party prevailed as the winner of the May 2023 elections, it was unable to form a coalition government because of their platform to reform Section 112. I cannot speak freely if you want to know my opinion. The crime of Liz Majesty must first be abolished. The tension is palpable. The police ask the activists to leave. Many Thais fear being accused of Les Majeste, as it has been used to prosecute over 100 people in the last two years alone, including Natashan, a 25-year-old activist charged when he was 22 for distributing leaflets calling for reform of the monarchy. He faced 3 to 15 years in prison. Just thinking about it makes me tremble. I was so scared. But yes, I wanted to fight. After a long fight through the court system, he was finally acquitted. Although he was found not guilty, convictions for royal defamation have multiplied in recent years in unprecedented ways. There is many cases of Article 112 here. The Move Forward Party did not propose to abolish the constitutional monarchy or even Section 112, the crime of Les Majeste. They campaigned to reduce the penalties for these crimes among the toughest punishments for royal defamation in the world. Parts made with forced labour in China may be used in cars around the world, according to a new report by Human Rights Watch. It says that it has found credible evidence that aluminium producers in Xinjiang use workers from government-backed labour transfer programmes linked to forced labour of Uyghur and other minorities. The report further details how the metal could then have entered the supply chains of global car companies. Now, for more, we can speak with Jim Wormington, the lead author of this report. Jim, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Now, China denies any allegations of forced labour or human rights abuses in Xinjiang. So how did you carry out your research? Yeah, our research was based on open source, so online research into the aluminium industry in China. So what we did is look at company documents, annual reports, financial reports, um, and also the government's own data, its own reporting. And we found evidence that companies and aluminium producers in Xinjiang were participating in what's called labor transfers, which is the coercive movement of Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims from rural areas of Xinjiang to urban areas um, in a coercive way where they don't have the option to refuse to take part in those transfers, where they're then put to work in industries like coal and aluminium. So 
your in your report, it also says that aluminium production in China increased sixfold between 2010 and 2022. What's China's strategy here? Yeah, so even as the Chinese government has increased its repression of Uyghurs in Xinjiang through mass surveillance, through detentions, through forced labor, it's also made Xinjiang um, an industrial hub. And for example, in the aluminium industry, that's because of the region's coal. Um, Xinjiang has access to very cheap and readily available coal. And so the government is using that very polluting um, but very cheap power to convert um, a, an ore into aluminium that can then be used by the car industry. So you have this really troubling combination of both a very highly environmentally damaging industry, producing a, producing a lot of pollution and greenhouse gases, and then um, the forced labour and labour transfers that are also in the industry. Now, international pressure has been mounting. The United States, for instance, has banned imports of products linked to forced labour from China. And global firms have enforced due diligence overall. Why then is it so difficult uh, when it comes to the auto industry? Well, for aluminium, and it's, it's not just unique to aluminium, um, it's actually very difficult to know what is or is not produced in Xinjiang. So, for example, Aluminium from the region, as you say, almost 10% of, of global aluminium supply flows out of Xinjiang, not as a finished product, but essentially as a raw metal. Uh, and it then goes into the rest of China where it's melted down, used to make parts of cars and to even to make the panels and body panels of cars themselves. Um, and so what that means is for an automaker that's buying aluminium in China, unless that car company knows exactly where the aluminium has come from, it's pretty likely that it includes some of that aluminium that's come out of Xinjiang and is linked to forced labor. And it's similar for other supply chains, whether it's cotton or polysilicon. But the challenge is not necessarily knowing how much is produced in Xinjiang, because it's, it's a lot for all three of those industries, but exactly where that metal is going and what products it's ending up in. So just very quickly, what can consumers then, and it's very difficult for businesses to make sure um, that this doesn't happen in their supply chains? Well, consumers, I think, have a hugely important role. The first thing is to send a clear message when you're buying a car, that you're interested in where that car was produced and, and how it was produced, what the materials in that car, are, where they came from and, and whether they were produced sustainably. But the second thing is that consumers are also voters um, and governments across the world are thinking about how to tackle abuses in supply chains, including forced labour. And in the EU, for example, right at this moment, the EU is negotiating a law that would ban imports linked to forced labor. And it's vital that voters push for those types of laws that can stop human rights abuses entering their markets. Well, Jim Wormington from uh, Human Rights Watch, thank you once again for joining us. Thank you. Now, France 24 has reached out to the car makers mentioned in that report and have so far got comments from two of them. General Motors says it remains committed to conducting due diligence to address any potential violation uh, of human rights in its supply chain. And Volkswagen says it has a risk management system already in place to make sure its suppliers uh, do not engage in any violation of human rights. Nagisa Shiota, Saika Totsuka and Felix Argyle, these popular anime characters have something in common. They're all considered otokonoko, boys who dress and behave like a girl. The term has become a subculture genre among men in Japan who like to dress in feminine clothing for entertainment, much like drug culture. Our team on the ground went to meet some of them. It's rush hour and Jin-kun is standing at one of the busiest intersections in Tokyo. The YouTuber is hoping to get noticed. In just 15 minutes, three men have tried to flirt with Jin-kun. <laughs> the influencer is an otokonoko, men who dress as women, influenced by a specific genre of romantic manga characters. Many of them show off their transformations on social media. The most popular and sought-after videos are the ones where I'm getting hit on. But these days, people recognize me more and more in the streets. 
so it's not so easy anymore. Otokonoko isn't centered around gender identity or sexual orientation, it's a form of gender expression. Mana identifies as a straight cis male who enjoys wearing feminine clothes. He doesn't want to show us his pre-makeup face. Every month, he comes to this studio for a photo shoot with a professional. How about these futuristic servant costumes to match with the backdrop? Do you like this one? Mana is a loyal customer. He spends around 500 euros a month here. The full package is great quality. When I do this, I understand women and their everyday problems a bit better. Like walking in heels, for example. After the transformation, it's time to pose. Mana hasn't told his friends about his hobby, but his wife is well aware. It's true, he goes on dates in full drag with his wife. Yes, but today's outfit is a bit too much. <laughs> the Otokonoko trend wasn't just born out of mangas and fueled by social media. Cross-dressing is a centuries-old tradition in Japanese arts, notably visible in traditional kabuki theatre. According to this researcher, a cross-dresser himself, metamorphosis is an integral part of Japanese culture. Many men would dress up in women's clothes in the 17th century. But by the end of the 19th century, a new law banned men from cross-dressing. They'd be stopped in the streets and arrested. This bar was one of the first ones of its kind when it opened 14 years ago. All the wait staff here are Otokonoko. They're so stylish. Their figures and postures are so pretty. When I came here for the first time, it was a bit strange. But they're not only cute, they're also attractive. Plus, because they are men like me, we can talk more openly. Otokonokos are gaining recognition both home and abroad. At the world's biggest Japanese animation festival in Tokyo, it was an Otokonoko-themed creation that won the public's vote. That's it for this week's edition of Access Asia. Do stay tuned if you can. There's more world news coming up here on France 24.